Liverpool, the Venice of the North, and its lifeblood, the River Mersey. From the very beginning, the docks here have determined the fortunes of this city. They've also allowed local criminals to play a part on the global stage. The most infamous was Curtis Warren, known as Cocky, a leading figure in the Liverpool Mafia and an international drug smuggling ring that controlled Britain's £2 billion a year cocaine business. The only known criminal to make it onto the Times Rich List. But Liverpool gangs haven't always been such high rollers. In the 19th century, the stakes were much smaller. An innocent man was kicked to death for just a few pence. It was a crime so violent, it caused public outrage and became a landmark in the war against gangs in Liverpool. We'll be looking at two very different gang crimes, one for sixpence, another for 40 million pounds. I'm looking at a contemporary report on gangs from a Liverpool newspaper of 1874, and it says, they were given up to every form of misconduct, morally and socially. They preyed upon society and degraded the very instincts of society. They were the corner men. I've come to Liverpool to find out more about the corner men who plagued this city over a hundred years ago. No wonder they used to call Liverpool the Venice of the North, so imposing. And all that grandeur and wealth came from the docks. In the 19th century, the docks covered 140 acres with 10 miles of key space. It was, effectively, a doorway to the world. To find out more about the city, I've come to meet local historian John Archer. What was Liverpool like in 1874? Well, Liverpool was the perhaps the leading port in the world, and so everything was based around the docks. So there were perhaps 20,000 ships coming in and out in a year. Tens of thousands of Irish people migrated here uh, during the Irish famine, the Great Hunger at the, the end of the 1840s. So you get a very large Irish population on top of a Welsh, Scottish. It was a very cosmopolitan place, Liverpool, uh, in the 1870s. Liverpool underwent a massive population explosion. Immigrants of every nationality flooded into the city. In just a few years, the population grew almost tenfold, reaching 530,000 by 1870. And what was employment like? There were too many people, in a sense. So most people perhaps could get three or four days' work a week on the docks. A lot of young lads initially were employed as nippers, and they're young men that sat on carts. But then they'd be made unemployed at 16 because the younger nipper is available. And there aren't a lot of jobs in a place like Liverpool. Yet the rich lived cheap by jowl, almost, with the poor. Because in the centre of Liverpool, you had St George's Hall and sort of large libraries, and uh, they were right slap bang next to the slums. This was where two worlds collided. The prosperity of one of the world's greatest seaports came face to face with some of the most appalling slums in Europe. This is Tide Barn Street. That way, it goes down to the Mersey and the docks and opens up to the sea with all its promise of opportunity and adventure. But in the late 1800s, if you walk that way, you'd walk into a maze of slums. The Victorian pedestrian, within five minutes, could go from hope to despair. What must it have been like to live in that murky underground world, a place made up of petty criminals and thugs who would turn to violence as a first resort? To help me explore this part of Liverpool's past, I've enlisted the help of historian Michael McKilwee. So what, who were the cornermen? It, it, they weren't really a gang, were they? No, they're just groups of young men um, that just hang around the street corners because they just haven't got enough money to go in the pub 
and buy beer. So they'd spit and swear and occasionally push people off the pavement and... and um... Just guys who couldn't afford to be in the pub? Yeah, yeah. So most of these people would have been working on the docks, although it's casual labour, so they're in one day, not working the next. So the rich one day, right. poor the next. We're standing outside a pub, there would have been another pub there, there's one over there. How many pubs were there in this well, area? Well, Liverpool was famous for its pubs. A newspaper estimated that if you put every drinking establishment in Liverpool in a straight line, They'd reach 11 and a half miles, so everything revolves around the pub, you know, the, the instantaneous pleasure of alcohol. But the hobnail boots were quite a famous part yeah, of I their mean, dress. Yeah, I mean, there were quite a few kicking incidents in, in, in the whole of Lancashire, because that, that was the weapon, along with your leather belt. I mean, everyone wore a leather belt to keep the trousers up, so in a fight, that would be the first thing to come off. And, of course, you've got a big steel buckle there. You, you hit someone in the face with, with a buckle, it's, it's similar to a knife wound, a slash. But this is where public houses are really living up to their name because your own house is not a nice place. The houses were so cold and dank anyway that you may as well be out on the street corners with your friends begging for money to, to try and get a drink, you know, if you haven't got enough money yourself. Since the late 19th century, Liverpool has been plagued by gangs. Gangs with names attached to them, gang fights, become more evident in the 1880s in Liverpool. But you do get more of a gang culture or a feeling for gang culture in the 1880s. Yeah. In this part of town, the fearsome cornermen claimed rule over the streets. This is a map of the city back then. And this is Tithebarn Street, running along here to the docks, with their huge berths all full of container ships. And up here, this is where our corner men would have hung out, wearing their trademark boots, their soles covered in deadly nails. The beatings they would hand out saw their notoriety soar, and they soon became known as a menace not to be messed with. So they were violent, usually drunk and fairly disorganised. The opposite of the guy I'm looking into, Curtis Warren. Born 1963. Unlike the cornerman Gary's looking at, this guy is full on. He operates on a much bigger scale. A drug baron in the Liverpool Mafia whose efforts made heroin and cocaine available to both rich and poor in every town in the UK. He rose from the street to make it onto not only the Times Rich list, but also onto the top of Interpol's list of most wanted men. Curtis Warren was the second son of a mixed-race seaman from South America who lived with his Spanish wife. Regarded as half-caste, he fell into neither the white nor the black gangs of the city and had to prove himself all the more. He grew up in the Granby area of Toxteth. There were alehouses, clubs, prostitutes and strip joints. Old West Indians in Panama hats smoked ganja. Women in saris ran stores. Hindus, Muslims, Rastafarians, and Christians all mixed together. I'm here to meet journalist Graham Johnson, author of The Cartel and Powder Wars, who can tell me a bit more about Curtis Warren. So this is Toxteth, where Curtis grew up. Yeah. What was it like during those years? The drugs cartel started here 30 years ago, and this is where people like Curtis Warren and other cartel godfathers came from. What, these streets? Yeah, just around here, yeah. Now, the part of Tocdis, which are very gentrified, and lots of money has been poured into it. But then, it was poverty-stricken. It was one of the most deprived parts of Europe. So you had a lot, a lot of connections to the docks. But listen, they all closed down in the early 80s. Loads of jobs went. 25, 30% unemployment around here. So it all kind of accumulated into the riots. Yeah. Did that change everything? Yeah, it changed everything. It changed uh, the criminal landscape. The riots were really an uprising. They were caused by deprivation and kind of racist, heavy-handed policing. And this was effectively turned into a no-go area. The police didn't want to come in here because uh, it was difficult for them to mount patrols and there were lots of tension between the police and the local population. You had a lot of kind of alienated people who couldn't find work. And it was like a pool of unemployed foot soldiers who thought, well, if we can't work in the, 
in the legitimate economy will work for the local drug dealers. It was kind of spun as a kind of, if you're doing this, it's a political act as well as a criminal act. It's kind of rebellion against the mainstream society. Age nine, Curtis Warren would climb through small windows and burgle homes. By 11, he dropped out of school and was carrying out muggings and armed robberies. At 12, he was stealing cars. As a teenager, he progressed to selling heroin. Well, Curtis Warren growing up around here, he must have just... I can understand where he's coming from, to be honest, because he must have just wanted to better himself. And you can understand why, I think, that kids that are living in these areas turn to crime. I mean, why not? I mean, some of these places that you're looking at, people live better in prison. I want to find out why Liverpool became a different city after the 80s riots and how they transformed the city's underworld. Uh, let's start at the beginning. How did the Liverpool Mafia come about? After the war, crime in this city was based around uh, commercial burglaries. It was based around smuggling contraband through the docks. So the, the, the crime gangs, both black and white, were pretty good and pretty experienced at getting you know, stuff through the stolen gear through the docks, getting it out and distributing it. They had a good import network, but what they needed was a good distribution network right. on the ground. Yeah. So after the riots, there was a very kind of convenient alliance was made between these white middle-aged criminals, these former armed robbers, and young black criminals from Toxteth. This alliance coincided with a massive influx of hard drugs into Britain, heroin and cocaine. Sean Smith has been a bouncer working on the doors of many of Liverpool's clubs. He noticed a dramatic change in the city when the white and black gangs first started operating together. I've worked on the doors since I was 16 years of age. Started getting good at my job, stopping people coming in clubs, being good with the licensees, managers, manageresses. People see you, people like you. Next week before I knew it, I was uh, looking after pubs, shops, nightclubs, uh, picking money up, dropping off to the bank for them. From when I started on the doors, it was years ago, people could end things on a handshake or, you know, I'll meet you tomorrow, let's have a straight in there, a phone call. When all the drugs hit the city in late 80s, early 90s, it basically just changed everything. Most of the trouble I had was from not letting grafters, drug dealers in the club. They'd come in, they'd come in the club, they'd speak to you, can we give a lad, give him a thousand tablets to sell in the club? Every night it's open, no. Come on and we'll give you a percentage, no. Because they had that many doors in the city, uh, and they got knocked back from that many doors in the city, he didn't like it, so we started getting problems. These people would leave the club. Your doorman would leave, the folly one or two, your doorman home. They'd be getting it over the head with bats, or the car blew up. Then it'd be going, you own the company, we want to come and get you. We work for... He's a big name in the drugs, we work for him, he's a big name in the drugs. We've got the money backed up by him. We'll burn your house, we'll torture your cars, we'll cough for all your dormant, we'll cough for your beard, and then we'll cough for you. And the drug culture and the impact they had on the city just changed everything. I was shot at umpteen times. It's documented, it's been in the papers. I've had my house blew up, I've had cars blew up. Uh, I've had my young daughter attacked. I've had my wife attacked. I've had a threat of war. Someone tried to shoot me in my house. But it's just a thing I didn't abide by. You know, if, if people want to take drugs and that's their choice. It's not my choice. But at the end of the day, I've seen what it does to people. It wrecks people's lives. I want to find out how Curtis Warren, a street-level dealer, became such a big shot. Tell me about Curtis Warren. Yeah. Right. So he starts off in Toxic as this kind of small-time drug dealer yeah. and ends up practically sitting on top of the pile with yeah. the Liverpool Mafia. Yeah. How does he do that? Well, he started off as a, as a burglar and then he got involved with a travelling network. Um, what the, th these were kind of unique 
uh, to this city. These were networks which would go out across the country to commit crime. Yeah. Scotland, Cornwall, London, the South Coast. And they'd be doing burglaries and selling drugs and whatever. And he got involved with one of them. And he got involved with one which went to Europe. And that was partly down to the football. Liverpool were doing well in the early 80s. Yeah. So you got lots of fans who were going abroad. And then they were getting nicked in places like Amsterdam and Rotterdam and Germany. They were going in jail. They were making contacts within the jail. And then and, and they started to build up a kind of a little drugs network. Is that how it, he started to travel through Europe because of yeah. football? Yeah. When I was growing up, there were lads in school who would get off school and go and do this. And he was involved in that. And then what he got involved in was uh, robbing tills and doing jeweler shops abroad. So he was kind of apprenticeship in how to do business abroad. Warren had several advantages over his rivals. He was brighter, smarter. He began to spread his net out wider. After a five-year prison stretch for armed robbery, he came out and made several trips to Europe. It wouldn't be long before Warren had built Britain's biggest ever drug importation business. We're looking at the gangs of Liverpool, old and new. And over a hundred years ago, the cornermen menaced the streets of the city. One of their attacks was particularly shocking and targeted an innocent young couple. It was Bank Holiday Monday, August the 3rd, 1874. And Richard Morgan and his wife Alice were on their way back across the river after a day trip to Birkenhead. It was around 9 p.m. when they got off the ferry and they met Richard's older brother, Samuel. They walked up Tithe Barn Street and on their way home, popped into a pub in Chapel Street for a final drink. They were ordinary people on an innocent night out. The events that were about to happen would not just shock this city, they would become a landmark tragedy in the history of gangs. Even though he lived in a poor district, Richard was a respectable shop worker, a married man in regular employment, something to be proud of in a city like Liverpool. So early that evening, Richard Morgan, his wife Alice and his brother Samuel had come off the ferry and were coming back up Tide Barn Street and popped into a pub, probably this one, for a quick drink. Coming out, they were surrounded by some corner men and one asked Richard if he had sixpence for a quart pint. Richard said, have you got a job? And at that point, one of the boys said, yeah, we got a job. We knock down people like you and get their money off them. That's our job. His wife Alice said, let's go. Come on, come away. And as Richard turned, a blow was landed behind his ear and he fell to the ground, never to get up again. His brother Samuel retaliated at once, knocking the assailant down. One of the gang whistled for backup. A third man started kicking Richard and then fell on top of him and choked him for what seemed like two minutes. Alice's wife jumped on him to try and protect him and someone took a running kick at her. She then came up and was hit in the ear and remained deaf forever after. His brother Samuel was lashing out at others who were trying to attack him. Crowds poured out of these pubs and instead of protecting Richard and his family, they egged on the perpetrators. And one woman was heard shouting, Give him it! Give him it! Richard was being hit and kicked. Someone took off their belt and scrutched him. But by this time, Morgan was dead. Then the perpetrators got up and ran down one of these side streets here. Samuel ran after them, but a knife came out. He was then attacked from behind and dragged away. Finally, they said, up to seven men kicked Richard Morgan across the width of Tide Barn Road. Distance of about 40 feet, like a football. On returning, Samuel found his brother's mud-spattered body had been placed on the steps of the warehouse. Someone was trying to give him brandy, but he was unable to drink it. Eventually, at 9.50 p.m., PC Adam Green arrived. He helped to take Richard's body to the North Dispensary in Vauxhall Road. The coroner found Richard's body shockingly cut and bruised. What appears to be a stab wound is identified on the left side of his neck. On his right thigh are two similar wounds. So I think what sort of riled these cornermen was probably Richard saying, where do you work? Yeah. The implication was that, that these guys didn't want to work yeah. and that he did. 
Yeah. And so there was a kind of class faction already between them. He, in a way, Richard, was, although he was living in the slums, I guess he was he, perceived as middle class. Richard was more respectable um, because he, he held down a job in a shop. Um, he'd not long been married, and a lot was made of that in the press, the fact that this respectable man has been beaten up by these work-shy scroungers, ruffians. This was at 9.30 in the night. It was a summer evening, so it was still light. And, of course, this is one of the major streets in Liverpool, one of the original seven streets. This wasn't some um, rough back alley uh, hidden away from the patrol and policemen. There were lots of witnesses to the crime, yeah. and yet nobody intervened. And not only did, did they not intervene, but some of them, including women, actually shouted encouragement to the attackers, such as, give it to them, give it to them. And in fact, some of the men then joined in the kicking. And that was so shocking uh, at the time. Well over 100 years later, and the kind of crime Curtis Warren is involved in is on a very different scale. Warren had been busy learning the craft of crime. To get an idea of the whereabouts of Curtis Warren, you have to look way beyond the streets of Liverpool. In 1987, he was in Switzerland. He went to France, Holland and to Spain, which had become a major drug importation centre. And then he made friends with two major drug lords from Liverpool. They would transform his career. And they went by the street names Scarface and Kaiser. Yes, they would. Yeah, because they would, you know, that's the kind of names uh, they, they were the kind of, the kind of names are good for business. And what they'd done, they were the first gang to bring a thousand kilos of cocaine over from uh, Colombia. Now, they would introduce Warren to the Carly Cartel, the biggest suppliers of cocaine in the world. Curtis Warren uh, came over as a, as a kind of, he was a small time drug dealer by then, and they introduced him to uh, a, a, a couple of Colombian brothers who were able to kind of serve him up cocaine in large amounts. And that was, that was how he got his, uh, his kind of step up into the big time. Curtis Warren's masterstroke was to cut out the middlemen and deal directly with the suppliers. No one else had ever done this. It shot him straight up into the big league. But Warren always looked way ahead of the game. While there was cocaine from Colombia, another drug's route had opened up, heroin from Afghanistan. On the 18th of November, 1993, a truck leaves the port of Felixstowe and heads for the M25. Its destination is Liverpool. Aboard is a consignment of heroin from Turkey. About 80% of the drug entering the UK is grown in Afghanistan and Pakistan before traveling the Balkan route to Western Europe. Drug runners are quick to know if they're being followed. They employ gangs of people to look out from footbridges like this. First sign of trouble, call the job off. This time, the driver is unaware he's being followed as he heads for the M6. The police have been keeping a discreet distance. 14 different cars are used to trail the truck. They even have a helicopter. They're not going to let this one slip away. The truck joins the M62 and pulls into Burtonwood service station near Warrington. He comes to a halt in the lorry park. And then one of the officers spots a rarely seen face, Curtis Warren. He observed the lorry and he, he was looking to see whether there was anything suspicious going on. Because uh, people who knew him said he had a kind of sixth sense, like many of these criminals, of you know when someone was on him and when, when he was getting investigated. He looked at this lorry and he wasn't happy with it. For some reason, it triggered an alarm. He walked away from it and uh, sacked it and let it go. But in many ways, it was too late. The truck set off from Burtonwood Services. It went across country to the M1 and headed south towards London. The truck pulled into Scratchwood Services. The Merseyside firearms team swooped, forcing the driver to the ground at gunpoint. They searched the truck. It appeared to be empty. The police dismantled the lorry. Behind a rear panel, they discovered a metal plate stretching the width of the trailer. There were 20 drawers, each 10 foot long, eight inches high, containing 180 kilos of pure heroin. Cut and sold on the street, it would have been worth up to 40 million pounds. 
At the time, this was the largest shipment ever captured in Britain. It gave the police the connection they needed to start a fresh investigation focusing on Curtis Warren. An innocent man lying dead in the street, the victim of extreme violence. The motive? To steal just sixpence. The public would be shocked and this single event would never be forgotten. It would be remembered as the Tithe Barn outrage. 26-year-old Richard Morgan had been killed over a sixpence. His brother Samuel bravely set off to capture the assailants. One of them was a violent man called John McCrave. So Samuel, the brother, I mean, what kind of a man was he? I mean, he chased, he chased uh, the attackers. He, he grabbed hold of one of them at one point and he got away and he was about to grab him again and the lad, John McGrave, turned around and pulled a knife on him. The crowd that had run with them um, down one of these side streets next to the pub actually pulled Samuel away, probably to protect him from John McGrave, who, who had a knife. So John McGrave ended up getting away altogether then. Travelling the short distance home, Samuel discovers the tragic news that his brother is dead. Did McCrave get caught later that night? Yeah, later on that night, McCrave ended up back on the scene to see what was going on. Somebody identified him and they went round to Samuel Morgan's house and told him that McCrave was back on the scene. So he went round and, uh, and McCrave was arrested. So this, this, this guy has lost his brother. He goes back home uh, grieving, I would have yeah. thought, Someone comes round and says, McCrave is on the street again. Yeah. What was McCrave thinking? I've no idea. And he came back out and just made a citizen's arrest. Yeah, it? and they handed him over to a, a, a passing policeman. Accused of murder by Samuel, McCrave boasts that he had witnesses to prove he didn't do it. They had McCrave, but what about the others? So when they brought McCrave in, did, did he admit to the murder? No, he blamed his two colleagues, um, Peter Campbell and Michael Mullen. Oh, that was nice of him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then the police started looking for them. And they'd escaped, had they? Yeah, Michael Mullen had um, woken up his brother, who was uh, staying in lodgings, and said, come on, let's stow away on a ship to America. So they immediately fled and got on a ship right. and were across the river when they were discovered. There was still a third man at large. Peter Campbell. He escaped to relatives in Chowbent near, near Bolton. And the police followed his sister, who then went, got on a train to visit him. Was she one of the ones goading him on? Yeah, well, it, it said in the, uh, the uh, trial that, that a female witness was shouting, give it to him, give it to him, and uh, probably it, it was her. This becomes a very public event straight away, doesn't it? There's a, it's, it's not just another murder in, yeah. in the slum. No, I mean, the national press, and especially the London-based press, are always going on that Lancashire and Liverpool are rough places. Most murderers know the victims and they're usually friends with them or it might right. be partners or wives. But he was a complete stranger and that was what else was shocking to middle class people. The idea that they too could become victims to similar crimes on major streets in the town, not just the rough areas. But over 100 years later, it would take more than one heroic individual to catch Curtis Warren. In 1993, the police had just captured £40 million worth of heroin, the largest haul ever seized up to that time. But they had nothing other than a sighting of Warren to link him to the crime. From a young age, Warren had learned every trick in the book. Even though Warren was only 11 when he left school, he spent his teenage years being educated in crime. Whereas a student would go from school to university, Warren would graduate from Boston to prison. But unlike most criminals and students, Warren doesn't smoke, drink, or take drugs. He has a photographic memory of numbers, telephone and bank account details. He never writes anything down. He frequently changes phones. He plans meticulously. The police knew they would need every help they could find to trap Warren. And their chance came when in the late 80s, Warren teamed up with a drug trafficker called Brian Charrington. Charrington would become a police informer. In 1991, he flew with Warren to Venezuela to set up a big cocaine shipment from the Cali cartel. 
Warren organised for the cocaine to be concealed in large ingots of lead. Just to give you an idea of the planning, the cocaine was shipped inside 32 lead ingots, this big. It meant that they couldn't be x-rayed, and to cut them open would take hours. It's also said that Warren knew the length of the drill bits that the customs used, 25 centimetres long. Now just take a look at this. 25 centimetres means you can't get anywhere near the centre. It was with such ingenuity he made the Liverpool Mafia Britain's first and most successful drug cartel. When the ingots arrived in England, customs were suspicious. When they cut one open, they found nothing and let the shipment go through. Only moments later, they got a tip off from the Dutch police, warning them that there was a cocaine shipment inside them. But it was too late. The ingots were already on their way to Liverpool. Inside was the cocaine. Warren's cup was an estimated 87 million pound. But even Warren's sixth sense couldn't predict that Charrington was informing the police. Now, at the same time, in another part of the operation, uh, one of Curtis Warren's partners, a huge car salesman from Middlesbrough called Brian Charrington, he was informing on Warren. So slowly but surely, the customs and excise were, were building a picture of, uh, of their target one. But drug money has a habit of corrupting every level. The case against Warren would collapse. Even though they connected him with the lorries, yeah. he walked free, right? The case against him was weak. And this was partly because there were complications to do with the supergrasses that were kind of involved in the case, particularly to do with this, his partner, Brian Charrington. There were allegations of uh, police corruption. There was a kind of murky involvement, uh, kind of higher up the chain involving MPs and the kind of Ch Lord Chancellor's office and so on. So anyway, the, the bottom line was that uh, the case didn't stack up. Warren got off, despite another supergrass testifying against him. Now, if anyone knows Kurtz Warren, it's this next guy we're going to see. He's Paul Grimes. Stood up in the dock, faced him, gave evidence against him, and is now known as a supergrass. Paul has just texted me his number and his address, and we're off there now, so uh, we'll see what he's got to say. How did you uh, first meet uh, Curtis Warren then? I had a scrapyard in Greenland Street, South End, and he was, he was going round the little factories, demanding the money off people that worked in them and all this. And I comes back to the yard and the, the lad in that he was looking after, he said, this fella's been in, blah, blah, giving it what for, he wants money. And he said, I couldn't give him none because we had none. I said, you don't give no one any fucking money out of my draw. Comes in, walked past me and my brother, went to the office and started giving it what for, and I walked around and went, who the fuck are you, you little cunt? Yeah. I said, you don't come in here, demand the money off any fucking one. I said, I'm telling you now. So the next thing, I kicked fuck out of him, phoned him an ambulance and put him in an ambulance. And the next thing, he was in jail and he's on the drug scene. How did you get involved in that whole ingot thing then? Because I had the scrap metal business. My brother was involved with the people that got involved with Warren. And he phoned me up to sell the ingots. After extracting the cocaine from the ingots, Warren had ordered his gang to bury the lead. But instead, some of them tried to sell the ingots to make a bit more money. When Grimes learned what had been inside the ingots, he informed customs. Paul Grimes gave evidence against Warren in court. He couldn't believe it when Warren got off. When they, all, they got necked and all that, he, he walked out to court. Yeah. Because the customs fucked up on it. So were you worried about that? No. When he, when he walked free? No. That didn't bother me at all. I was still walking around. I'll tell you one thing that I did do, though, for a while, I carried the shotgun on with me. Mm. So I went off. It must have been a worrying time for you. At that time, yeah, for the yeah. first couple yeah. of weeks and all that, and then once it died down, that was it then. What made you uh, decide to bring him down? Because of him up there. Paul's son died a heroin addict. It hardened Paul's resolve to try and right some wrongs. He didn't mind crime, but he had no time for drugs. If he was doing what I was doing, robbing banks and all that, good luck to them. But once the drugs and my son died of the drugs, I didn't give a fuck who he was or who he I just have them in the story. And as I said before, 
I stood on over his grave and I said, I will get these people for you, and that's what I've done. So we just come out of Paul's house, and there was one question in my head before we got there, and that was uh, why he turned against uh, Warren, and what gave him the kind of momentum to get up there in the stand and, and face Warren in court and become a supergrass. And I think when he told us the story about how his boy died on the drugs that they were bringing in, it all kind of makes sense. Um, I think any father would feel the same. I don't think, I think you stop caring about your own life and uh, you go after the person that you think killed your son. So I can understand it, it makes sense to me now. Warren had walked. Although Merseyside police had captured two huge shipments, they had missed Warren every time. In 1996, Curtis Warren relocated to Holland to a secluded and well-protected house in the quiet town of Sassenheim, lying between Amsterdam and The Hague. But this wasn't retirement. Warren carried out business as usual. The, the authorities decided that if they were to go after him again, they would have to kind of streamline the operation. And in this case, the Dutch authorities took the lead. Despite Warren's careful planning, there was one thing he didn't expect. In Dutch law, it's legal to wiretap without a warrant and use it in a court of law. The Dutch police were listening in to all of his activities. Time was running out for Curtis Warren. He was Interpol's target number one. By 1996, Curtis Warren was a very rich and powerful man. He stashed his money away in Swiss bank accounts. He's said to have owned over 300 houses in the Northwest, mansions and office blocks in Britain, casinos in Spain, his villa in Holland, discos in Turkey, property in the Gambia, and even a vineyard in Bulgaria. He could have retired to a tropical island never to be seen again, but this was Curtis Warren. Another shipment was already underway. You know what fascinates me though is why didn't he stop when he had all the money, when he was sitting at the top, why did he go back to Holland and start bringing in more when he didn't have to? Yeah, well, that's a good question. And, uh, well, the whole, you know, listen, the whole thing is driven by vice, it's driven by greed, it's driven by a lust for power, which for me and you, it's difficult to kind of get our heads around it. And that's what it was. And I remember one of his best mates asked him that question, why are you doing this? And he said, well, it gets me out of bed in the morning, otherwise I'd be sat at home, you know, in my boxer shorts, watching Richard and Judy on the telly. This time, cocaine from Venezuela was shipped to Bulgaria. On October the 24th, 1996, the consignment arrived in Holland. That night, Dutch SWAT teams raided Warren's home and a warehouse. And through a complex kind of undercover a surveillance operation involving wiretaps. They managed to catch him red-handed, bringing in uh, another superload of cocaine. He goes to trial, it stacks up, and he goes to jail for, for a long time. The top five men in Warren's drug ring were among the 10 men dragged from their beds and arrested. The police confiscated 400 kilograms of cocaine, 60 kilos of heroin, 1,500 kilos of cannabis, and 50 kilos of ecstasy. Their street value, 125 million pounds. Simultaneously, British police searched premises across Northwest England to arrest the gang's other cohorts. This was the culmination of Operation Crayfish, the biggest joint investigation at that time ever mounted by the police and the customs officers. In the case of the murder of Richard Morgan, the trial went to court. There were three suspects in the dock, Michael Mullen, John McCrave and Peter Campbell. The fact that the public wanted these men flogged to death was a sign of how much they despised these street thugs. I guess uh, the three of these guys had a, an example made of them. Yeah, um, the, the, the three of them were convicted of murder and uh, sentenced to be hanged. Now, the, the jury did give a recommendation of mercy to Peter Campbell. Because he was respectable, people did um, put up two petitions 
in favour of him escaping the death penalty and uh, he was granted a reprieve right. and sentenced to 20 years in jail instead. The Tithe Barn outrage sparked a public debate about gangs and street violence that pinpointed unemployment, housing conditions, punishment, police inefficiency and lack of political will as root causes. Crime had moved to the top of the political agenda in Britain and um, a lot of newspapers were finding that crime sold newspapers. Was there a sense that the police weren't doing enough? The police had allowed the cornermen more and more control of the streets. That is, the police hadn't moved them on. The police walked by the groups of young men on corners. They weren't forced to move on, which is what police were meant to do. This made the cornermen even more disrespectful of the police, and right. um, they sort of gave them a sense of power. Many articles were published about the incident in London newspapers and journals. The story touched the nation. Alice Morgan was quoted as saying, my husband was murdered for sixpence. All they got from Richard Morgan was sixpence, and, and that became quite a statement that Richard's life was only worth sixpence. This it was what, worth yeah. murdering someone yeah. for that amount of money. There was a rage for drink in this town. That They, were, they said that Liverpool had a drink problem, in a sense, and, uh, and this murder sort of encapsulated that. Although violence was not unique to Liverpool, what seemed to single out the town was that such violence seemed to be approved by the lower classes of the town and not condemned strongly enough by the more respectable inhabitants. So Liverpool itself was condemned as negligent and corrupt. Did this change anything? No, well, the funny thing is, a couple of weeks after the murder, um, there was another um, gang beating of, a, of an innocent man who uh, was beaten with belts and kicked. And as they were kicking him and, and beating him, the, the, the lads were shouting, we don't care if we hang for it, like McGrave and Mullen. So it, it meant absolutely nothing to them. And in fact, three years later, the sister of one and the brother of another ended up kicking another man to death. Did people recognise that the poverty and the slums and the unemployment of Liverpool was what was co really causing this trouble. Um, a bit later, in the 1880s, you start to get those um, views coming up. But in the 1870s, they were still seen as drunken, work-shy scroungers. And from the 1880s onwards, you start getting efforts made by so-called do-gooders at, at the time to actually improve things. So you've got, you know, campaigns for edu education comes in 1870. Uh, you've got um, campaigns for better housing, um, temperance campaigns to save people from uh, drink, and also the, the rise of boys' clubs um, and early youth clubs. Yes. And that all starts coming in to start tackling this problem of young people hanging about on the streets and, and the violence and the binge drinking. Such violence sparked public debate that pinpointed unemployment, housing conditions and lack of parental control as root causes. They also blamed the rise of penny dreadfuls, cheap magazines glorifying the exploits of criminals. In the same way video games are blamed today, some things never change. Even though he was behind bars in a high-security prison in Holland, Curtis Warren didn't stop. On September the 15th, 1999, while in the exercise yard, he was attacked by another prisoner. Warren retaliated with such force, the prisoner was taken to hospital where he died. Warren was found guilty and convicted of manslaughter. In 2005, he was accused of running a drug smuggling cartel from his cell but the case was dropped because of insufficient evidence. Warren was released in June 2007 and returned to Liverpool. If he got out of jail, the first thing can, he's looking to do a deal, he's looking to do some graft, he's looking to link back up with his old mates. He's not looking to go straight uh, or he's not looking to kind of retire. And that's the problem really, you know, he's a, you know, he's a born criminal. In 2009, Curtis Warren was jailed once more after being caught trying to smuggle £1 million worth of cannabis into Jersey. Although he took all the usual precautions and used phone boxes, which are virtually untraceable, this time he was under constant surveillance. This time the authorities had the evidence. He's currently being held at Her Majesty's Prison, Full Sutton, where he serves a sentence of 13 years. 
But in the end, you know, I think crime is always the same, especially when you get involved in drugs. Uh, the people that you start to work with, even though you reach the top of your game, I don't believe that you can escape. I think once you're in it, you're in it for life. And I think that's what happened to Curtis Warren.